song please turn your hymnals into hymn number 245 245 more about Jesus shall we all stand for an opening song Jesus, 
Let's bow together in prayer. Father in heaven, this is not our weekly club meeting. We've come here because of you. We are here to bow before you, to kneel before you, the Holy One, the mighty God, our Creator, our Redeemer, the One who loves us and gave His only Son for us. Lord, meet with us. Come into our lives. We know we are frail and erring, but you love us so. Bless us as we worship you and as we fellowship with one another is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he's controlled, and you know, since I gave my heart to Jesus, the longer I serve him, ah, the sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, the more love he bestows. You know, each day is like heaven. My heart overflows. Because the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Every need he is supplying, and plenteous grace he bestows, and every day my way gets brighter, because the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Oh, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. And the more that I love him, the more love he bestows. 
And you know, each day is like heaven. And my heart just overflows. Because the longer I'm serving him, ah, the sweeter he grows. Good morning, church family. This morning, the tithes and offerings are going to go to the local <clears throat> conference advance. Each Sabbath, worship service is an acknowledgement that our God is our creator. God is not only the creator, but he also is the owner of all. As Leroy Froome stated it, he wrote, the title emerges, the tithe emerges, is the basis of acknowledgement and all conference comprehensive ownership and sovereignty of God. That is from Ministries, May 1960. The wonderful news is that God is the caring owner. He has a great expense, made provisions to rescue us from sin in this world. He gave before we ever asked him to give anything to us. Today, when we return the tithe, let us remember that we recognize God as the owner of everything. He only asks us to return one-tenth of what he has given us. He trusts that we will usually, usually, use it wisely what he has given for us. The offering today is for the conference advance. Because we support this offering, the conference is able to provide programs and benefits for our church, our schools, and our communities. It is our conference, and these are our programs, com programs that provide support and outreach. Will the deacons please rise? Dear Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that Jesus is our creator and our redeemer. All that we have comes from you. Bless this offering, and we return it to you, your portion of what we have been given. Please bless these funds given to advance your work here at Piedmont Park and the Kansas-Nebraska Conference. Thank you for providing. In Jesus' name, amen.
That was a, a beautiful song. Thank you. You know, I'm amazed when I see how much talent this church has. And uh, Vern's reading earlier and his wife playing the piano. I really appreciate that. You know, sometimes it's good when the pastors are gone because the laity gets to step up and be more active in the, the worship service. Of course, our, our pastors are in uh, Texas now at, at a pastor's convention, and then they're going to be staying in Texas for the general conference session. So uh, we, as the members of the church, get to be more involved with the worship. And I, for one, am looking forward to Kirk Brown's sermon today. Uh, it's always good to uh, get new perspectives, new, uh, new, new sermons here. Uh, let's see how everyone is feeling today. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Oh, you sound good today. We have a few uh, announcements here today. Uh, first of all, the Piedmont Peddlers are going to be uh, going on their, their Sabbath afternoon ride. They'll be starting at Wilderness Park. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the Wilderness Park parking lot off of Pioneers is where they're going to be starting, and that starts at 4 p.m. And then tonight, our own Ryan Watson is going to be having a, uh, a concert at New Creation Church. And for those of you who don't know the address, it's in the bulletin, so you can look that up. And uh, next week, we are going to be meeting at Holmes Lake after the worship service for our potluck. This should be a fun afternoon of fellowshipping and enjoying uh, the food that everyone brings and then also being able to, to hang around Holmes Lake and just uh, fellowship with one another. And of course, the big thing that's coming up in July is the Vacation Bible School. Uh, we still have some needs for Vacation Bible School, and this week is the last week to get in the supplies that they need for VBS. So uh, there's a, a list of needs in the bulletin. Please look that over. If there's anything that you can provide, uh, VBS would be very uh, appreciative of that. And, oh, sure. And we have an announcement regarding that. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we do have flyers available for you to give out to friends, neighbors, cousins, anybody that you'd like to invite out to Vacation Bible School. Um, I'll be in the back, and I have these available for you, um, for you to have as many as you want. And also, if, you've helped, if you have signed up to help out with VBS, make sure to be checking your email. I'm going to be sending out a couple dates for trainings, and you'll, need to, um, you'll want to come to at least one of those to see how your role is going to fit in the whole thing. So thank you. Thank you. And that's a wonderful ministry that this church, on, this church puts on every year and look forward to another wonderful Vacation Bible School. And then one other thing I want to make sure that we bring to everyone's attention is that next week we're going to be starting a new format for the Sabbath School classes. Uh, in an effort to foster more of a small group atmosphere in the Sabbath School classes, uh, all the classes are going to be starting directly at 930. So there won't be the communal song service beforehand. Uh, just go directly to your Sabbath School classes and now, I'm looking forward to seeing how this works out to see if we might be able to foster more of a, a close-knit Sabbath school class and, and be able to take that, that uh, feeling and then spread it out into the, into the community here in Lincoln. So uh, with that, we have, uh, we have a membership transfer to, to do, so I'm going to turn this over to Leon to welcome the new, new members of our church. Thank you, Scott. Last uh, Sabbath, we had the... Oh, I'm not going to say privilege, but the sadness of, of transferring somebody out. But today we get to the joy of transferring somebody in. Sunday Gok is going to come to us from Community Praise, Alexandria, Virginia. Sunday, are you here this morning? Please come forward. We, we would like to give you a, a welcome packet, and I'm, I've asked Renee to come up and help us with that. Good to see you here. We, okay. uh, we'd like to introduce to you Sunday, and I don't know the little one. Who's the little one? This is Hope Legner. Okay, very good. So uh, we'd like to uh, officially uh, introduce her to the church, and, and we'd like to transfer her membership. Do we have a, uh, okay, we have a, a first call. Uh, now, do we have any questions? All in favor? Okay, very good. Look at your church family. We're so glad to have you here. I'm going to give this over to them. Something you may not know about Sunday is that she speaks more than just English. How many languages do you speak? About three. She speaks three different languages. 
fluently, and she uh, works as an interpreter. So I thought that was pretty special. Um, Sunday, we're going to give you a packet today. Inside of that is your membership transfer. Hi. And um, also, there's a spiritual gift assessment in there, and uh, personality and ministry assessment. And also, there's a shield the vulnerable sheet. And so we hope that you get involved. And everything you do is going to have to do with children. So we do ask you to do the shield, shield the vulnerable as well. I know that when I took the spiritual gifts seminar assessment, I was really surprised. And you may be too, but it's always very insightful. Say hi. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome Sunday. Okay, thank you. God bless you. Our song of praise this morning is hymn number 310. I would run nearer to Jesus. Marvelous Grace 109, first verse only. possible, I would encourage you to kneel for a prayer. Our kind, wonderful, loving Heavenly Father, 
we come before you this morning seeking your presence. You have promised us that where two or three are gathered together in your name that you would be here. So, Father, we know for assurance that indeed you are here with us through the power and the blessing of your Holy Spirit. And, Father, as we hear we are here, I would indeed ask that each one of us could draw near to, you, to your Son as a result of our time here. And Father, we just thank you for the marvelous grace that you have extended to us, that grace, that uh, gift that we have. And Father, we thank you so much for that gift of your Son that you have given to us, the gift that will give us eternal life as we believe. So, Father, as we are here, may we become more and more your believers, and may we uh, show to others the great love that you have for us. Father, we are uh, facing difficult times. I pray, Father, that each one of us would open your word through the power of your spirit and study. Amen. Study to know for, with uh, an assurance what we believe, what we stand for, and what this church stands for. And Father, we're moving into a time where each one of us needs to say with an assurance, not my will, but thy will be done. And Father, I think of the general conference session that we have coming up, and you know I've been praying for the, each of the delegates, those people that will be voting, and Father, I pray that as they have been studying your word leading up to this, you've called them for a special purpose to be your voice. So Father, I pray that they have been studying and that they have been seeking out your will, not their will, but your will. And when they are faced with each and every vote that they're going to be taking, the committees as they're bringing issues to the body uh, for a full vote, May each person, each representative, seek out your will. And it might mean, as a result of their study, that they have to put their own will aside. So be it, Father. Let this be a unifying and not a splitting time. Because, Father, we need a uni united church to move forward to face the difficulties that are encountering uh, and, and, le and surrounding us now. So, Father, I just pray pray, pray for this service that uh, Kirk would bring to us that special message that you have given him, and may it inspire us to ever closer relationships with you. So we ask and pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes 9, 11 to 2, 12. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. For man also does not know his time like fish in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare. So the sons of men are snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. I know a pastor from another faith group, and in their tradition, they're assigned scripture readings that the church at large follows so that every three years they read through and also preach through the entire Bible. We don't do that in the Adventist church. We're a bit more spontaneous, yielding to the unction of the Holy Spirit, leading or inspiring the pastor to choose the topic for the day. Well, in the Adventist tradition, I'm, I'm following that today. I'm going to, but I'm going to preach from a passage that I've never heard anyone preach before. 
Uh, we don't preach through the Bible, so sometimes there's some spots, some places that you just don't hear about. But it's good once in a while to veer off into some of the lesser known and explored parts of Scripture. It is, after all, the Word of God, right? The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong. Somewhere in the Bible, I don't know where, it's a little like Paul when he said... uh, Well, somewhere it says uh, that a man will leave his mother, a woman leaves her home, and the two shall come together and there'll be one flesh. I'm like, oh, Paul, that's, that's, that's the second page of Genesis. But he couldn't remember. Well, there's a, there's a story somewhere I can't remember. But it's about a commander of Israel's army who sent a runner to tell the king the news of the battle. Well, the, men, the man was sent off, and he began running to tell the king. But there was another fellow nearby, and he was all excited, and he saw, that guy's going? Well, I can run faster than him. And so he's, well, well, I'm going to go. I'll beat him. And he did beat him. And he came running up, and the king's servant said, a runner approaches. And so he was given entrance, and the king says, have you come from the battle? Yes, I have. Tell me what happened. Well, uh, there was a great commotion, and there was uh, the swords, and people were falling, and there was blood, and there, and, and there was this, and he says, what happened? Well, I really don't know. King's sermon said, another runner approaches. Hey, stand aside. Move over. And the man with much zeal, who was very fast, stood to the side while the runner that the general sent came bowed down to the king and very eloquently reported the news from the battle. The race does not always go to the swift. You ever hear of uh, Lance Armstrong? Oh, yeah. The fastest man, the swiftest man ever to ride a bicycle. He won the race year after year after year, more than anyone in history, until his name was stricken from the record books because he cheated year after year after year, and he lied about it year after year after year. You know, I find it a curious thing. Some people, even in the Christian community, say that, you know, the law of God, well, that's kind of been done away with. We're under a better law now. But at the secular world says, you cheat, you're in trouble. You lie, you're in trouble. Well, that's for another time. But it's interesting. The battle does not always go to the strong. You ever hear of King Sennacherib of Assyria? Well, Israel sure had. They came, he came, and surrounded Israel with a huge army. And the king of Assyria wrote a very insulting and blasphemous letter to the king of Judah, Hezekiah. Well, the king took the letter to the temple, and he spread it out. He rolled it out before the Lord, and he said, Lord, look what this man is saying about you. He prayed, and he asked God to restore honor to his name and to deliver Jerusalem from certain destruction. that, That night, God sent one angel, one angel, And in the morning, surrounding Jerusalem were 185,000 dead Assyrian soldiers. Ever hear of the story of David and Goliath? The battle does not always go to the strong. 
Now, almost all of us have seen or at least heard about the savages in Iraq beheading Christians because they're Christians. Well, they don't stop at that. They kill children and do things that I wouldn't want to tell you. But even people of their own faith, their Muslim brothers, they're killing them because you don't believe exactly what I believe, so I'm going to kill you. Evil times, evil times. Verse 12 of the Scripture reading, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 12. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. God's Word is true. We see this happening, but it's disturbing. Not God's Word, but what we see happening in our world. It's disturbing. It's disturbing because the truth about life as we know it is often very ugly, very cruel, very unfair. The race doesn't always go to the fastest. Sometimes the fastest loses. Sometimes the strong don't win the battle. Over and over, we see this. Last month, my sister-in-law died. She was in her 40s. Years ago, when I was a chaplain in Texas, every summer, every summer, there was a toddler who would drown in a pool in in somebody's backyard. Sometimes it was two a year. Sometimes it was three in a summer. But always, every summer, it happened. We live in evil times, and life and everything about life is uncertain and unpredictable. Have you noticed this? Has this happened in your life? Long ago, Jesus told a parable of a wealthy man who looked at all that he had, and he decided, hey, I'm going to build more and bigger, and I'm going to relax, and I'm going to pursue pleasure, and I'm going to enjoy my life. And God said to him, you fool, you don't realize that tonight your life will be demanded of you. Verse 11 says, the race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned. But time and chance happen to them all. I don't know if I like this. I don't know if I like this. But it's true. Is it true for you? Do you know somebody that this is true for? There is a principle here that Solomon is pointing us to. It's bigger than races and battles, wealth and human intelligence. We often cannot choose our direction in life. There are roadblocks and detours that come to us. Vegans sometimes get cancer. Young athletes often suffer terribly with health problems. Those who excel in doing evil, who are arrogant and selfish, sometimes live in security and enjoy long life. I'm not going to name names, but they're there. It's true. Being very skilled or educated is no guarantee that you will have a job. Do you know this? There is a randomness and an uncertainty that pervades life, and we cannot escape that reality. We cannot. 
all of our plans, our goals, strivings, hard work, good intentions, our unselfish service, all of our education, wealth, intelligence, honor, and fame. It comes and it goes. Nothing is certain in this life. And sometimes the fastest one loses the race. And sometimes a fledgling boy throws a rock at a giant, cuts off the head of the strongest warrior in the whole earth. How can this be? And yet it happens. Let me illustrate this principle, if I may, from my own life, if you'll indulge me for a few minutes. I'll just stick to my career as an example, though there's a lot of random disappointment I could speak of of, from other areas of my life. I went to college four years, graduated, went to graduate school three years, graduated. I was a church pastor. That's what I wanted to do. That was my goal. It's what I set myself to do. And I had wonderful evidence that God approved of my decision. I wish I could tell you the story. It's wonderful. It's, it's like miraculous. It's always been an anchor to me and to my wife in, in our lives and all the moving around and uprooting and going here and there. Uh, it's been an anchor in our lives. I was ordained early. I was promoted regularly. And after 15 years of hard work and selfless service, oh, I was crushed by some well-meaning, faithful, upstanding, righteous saints of God. Ooh, that doesn't sound good, does it? It wasn't. I was so broken, I couldn't pastor for a while. I literally, one day, looking through the yellow pages, thinking, what can I do? What can I do for a living? I can't do this right now. Well, I became a chaplain. And with that, a couple more years of education... In many ways, they were good years. I was not crushed, but boy, did I get bruised again by the good saints of God. More roadblocks here and there. You know, when your boss does not want you around, it's best to just kind of leave quietly. Did you know that? I've discovered that. Fighting, you know, and standing up for your rights. I have rights. I'm going to stand up for my rights. Why doesn't that sound good? Ooh. You know, usually it just makes it worse. You get crushed, broken. It's usually better just to kind of leave, leave quietly. Well, I couldn't find work in all of Kansas City. I couldn't find work. So I went to an interview on the East Coast. I don't want to move to the East Coast, but... I need a job, so I went to the East Coast. I had, I had three possibilities that were uh, developing in Lincoln, Nebraska. Lincoln, Nebraska. Bryan Hospital, right there, was courting me. They really wanted me to come and work. I interviewed to be the director of a small organization here in town. Uh, those didn't work out. The one that worked out was to work on a contract basis part-time with a small private college here in town. Well, the next year that turned into a full-time job. And for a number of years, guess where I worked? Union College. Yeah, I worked there. And up until that point, none of my career wanderings and long longings seemed to make much sense to me. Over 20 years of it, I felt like a son of promise who ended up not doing too well. But you know what? After a year or two at the college, I sort of felt like as I looked back 
and I thought about my varied work experience, it was the best possible training for my position at the college, and I loved it so. Now I understand. Now it seems to make sense. God, thank you. Thank you for leading me and preparing me for what I could not foresee that I would be so very tailored and qualified to do. And that would be such a joy to me. Thank you. It seems to all make sense now. But as the Scripture says, time and chance happen to us all. And so when the economy blew up in 2008, I found myself not being hired for the next year. So, does that mean that that 25 years of wandering and waiting was actually not for this purpose? It was not for this time, a time such as this? Well, it literally took me less than five minutes to get another job. I, because of my experience with work, I, I've got one thing, but I'm thinking I better be planning for something else because I never know, and sure enough. So anyway, less than five minutes, I had another job. But you see, I, I didn't want another job. You ever have that happen to you? I, I, I don't want another job. I like this one. I'm pretty well suited to this. I really like this. I had devoted my life to working for the church. I don't want another job. And so, reluctantly, I came to see and accept that I was not going to be able to work for the church, I was going to have to settle for working for God. Well, somewhere in the scripture it says, Your mourning will be turned to joy, you know. But those things we long for, that we cling to, that we become so tied to, this is what I want to do. Oh, no, I can't do that anymore. I can't work for the church. What am I going to do? I guess I'll just have to work for God. Oh. <laughs> I think maybe that's what heaven's going to be like. We're going to look back and we're going to say, what was that? Was I upset about that? I don't know. It's what what is just... <laughs> Uh, now listen, I've been talking about me the last few minutes, but I hope you've been imp applying this idea, this principle to your life. I have a question for you. I want you to think about your life for one minute and ask yourself, is this what I planned for my life? Do you understand the twists and the turns, the disappointments and heartaches that have come your way? The unfulfilled longings and dreams. Now, I want you to think about that in the context of your own life for one minute, okay? Go.
The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong. Time and chance happen to them all. I've learned something very important in the last 35 or so years of my life. The purpose of life is not to attain security or to have a comfortable position in life or a distinguished job with a respectable title or to acquire wealth or education or have the respect of others or to have the respect and the honor from the church. It's not to have a name for yourself, or any of a thousand other shiny things that go by that we think we want. That is not the purpose of life. The purpose of life oh, who am I to say this? The purpose of life. Hey, I'm going to tell you because I've read the book. The purpose of life is to be faithful to God. Regardless of what you do, regardless of what you are forbidden to do, regardless of what happens to you and those you love, the purpose of life is to be faithful to the one who made you and gave you life and laid down his life to redeem you. You can say it a hundred different ways. Love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Go to Nineveh and give this message. Build an ark. They'll make fun of me. They'll laugh at you. If I do this, there's no water around here. There are other things I could do. Can I just preach about you and tell people about you? That's a worthy goal. God, can I please? Noah, I want you to build an ark. Leave your home and go to the place I will show you. Mary, I know you're a virgin, but you are going to have a child. People are going to talk about that. She didn't say that. She said, be it so, according to your word. That's being faithful. Sell all that you have and follow me. For that man, that's what it meant to be faithful for God. It may not be, <laughs> for some of us, wouldn't that be easy? <laughs> okay, <laughs> garage sale done, here we go. <laughs> but for that man, that was what being faithful meant for him. But it may not be for me. I, I, build an ark, nope. You shall not covet. That's the word that some of us need to hear. That's what being faithful means to some in the hearing of my voice. Nathan, go to the king and tell him he's a rotten scoundrel. What he has done is evil. You go tell him that. Not a good idea for me, Lord. Go. And Nathan was faithful to God. He did what God told him to do. Wasn't a good idea from Nathan's perspective. He followed the word of the Lord for his life. My son, I will not take this cup from you. I want you to carry the, the sins of the whole world. And I want you to die the most painful death possible. 
God, please take this away from me. Don't let, don't let this happen. Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. The message is the same. It's always the same. But it comes to each of us in different times and in different ways. The call to be faithful to God. And in doing so, God desires to mold and to shape us, to fit us for heaven and to rescue everyone who cooperates with him, everyone who is faithful. Hebrews 11, you know this chapter. It's called the faith chapter. And it's a list of, of some of the greats of old. And it talks about their walk with God. About what God called them to do. About what faithfulness meant for them. Everyone is different, but everyone is the same. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. I know someone I remember just being stunned when they spoke the word. Well, being a Christian means you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I believe that He is the Son of God. Therefore, I, I, I'm, I, I'm redeemed. I'm saved. That's a starting point. But you know everybody... You know why everyone in this chapter is in the chapter? Because they were faithful... But guess what? They always did something. They always did something. That's how faith is perfected. That's what brings honor to God. This idea that God wants our head, you know, if I just think the right thoughts, I'll be, I'll, I'll be you know, I'm, I'm redeemed, I'm saved. If I just... Does my wife want me to just think good thoughts or treat her nice? <laughs> Ask her. I'll, I can tell you, right? Okay? God wants all of us, not just, oh, my head, think this way. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, so he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Did you know God rewards those who earnestly seek him? By faith, Noah, well, he built an ark. He condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, it goes on and on. And it says all these people were still living by faith. They weren't believing. They were living by faith when they died. And that's why they're in here. Now, Samson, I'm not quite sure I get that one, but he was living by faith there at the end. But man, did he have his ups and downs, and a lot more downs than ups. But you know what? That is God's grace. He's in there. He's in there. Maybe you and I could be there too, you suppose? Every week, I get up earlier than I want to. One day a week, and I drive over 100 miles to central Nebraska to work in a nursing home filled with people who have a chronic mental illness. And there I serve them. Some of them have four or five mental illnesses. I have not aspired to do this work, but it is what my hand has found to do. 
And this week, I was sitting with the man, and suddenly I realized that, you know what? He just wet his pants. And I don't mean a little bit. He didn't say anything about it, so I didn't say anything about it. He didn't be, seem to be too concerned. So, here I am, Dr. Brown, we're doing psychotherapy. Your pants are wet. But you know what? I have learned something. I have learned something. Every week before I enter that building, I remember the words of Jesus. Whatever you have done to the least of these, my brother, my brethren, you have done it to me. And I think about that, and I remember that, and I try my best to do that and to live that. And in my mind, that makes what I do in sitting with the man with the wet pants a sacred work because I'm not doing it for me. I'm not even doing it for him. I'm doing it as unto God. John the Baptist said, he must increase, I must decrease. And Jesus said, whoever among you wishes to be great, let him be a servant. I'm beginning to understand these things and what it means. These words are becoming salvation to me. Maybe you have other words, but those are becoming the words I need to not just hear, but to live and to have joy in decreasing and to have joy in serving the least of these. What things are you beginning to understand? Listen, it is not right to rail against those things that God brings in our lives that are meant for our salvation. It's not right to rail and complain against the things that come to us that we need for our salvation. Don't you think? It's a mystery. It's a hard thing. It's a paradox. It's like, I hate this. I'm grateful for this. I don't understand that. What does that mean? It means God in His mercy has not abandoned us to the randomness of life, even though it looks that way. God is working for our good. He is working for our salvation. And sometimes that means we have to lay down what is so dear to us in order to have something so much better, something like eternal life, being in the presence of Jesus forever, let us not be in danger of missing the whole point of life. It's not about being fair. That's not what life is about, being fair. It's not about working hard. It's not about having a flawless life. It's not about making money or being successful or any of these other things that we distract ourselves with, forgetting that the purpose of life is to be faithful to God and to love one another as Jesus loved us. Read the Bible and you will see this everywhere. Now look, there are many themes and many important things in the Scripture, but this is the one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Follow Him. Be faithful to Him until death. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the one great thing. 
that all of the stories are about. So many of our strivings, our longings, our goals really are in vain because evil times come. Time and chance have their way with us. Our years pass with a moan, and then we are gone. The Word of God abides. How long? It's forever. And those who love this Word, and more than that, embrace Christ in their hearts and live for Him to serve, obey, honor, and follow Him. This is the purpose of life. This is what we're called to do, to be faithful unto death. You know what Jesus said? Those who do this will shine like the sun. Now, I don't know what that means. The best I can do is I can reflect the sun a little bit if, the, you know, if it's the right angle. To shine like the sun, I don't know what that is. But I think... I'd like that. It sounds kind of warm, you know, and comfortable to be shiny and sparkly and just, I don't know, I just, I like that. Jesus said we're going to shine like the sun. The pure in heart will see God. Jesus said that. The pure in heart will see God. The meek will inherit the earth. Hebrews chapter 12, after all of these who have been faithful, here's what it says. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. The battle is not to the swift. I guess I got that wrong. The race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. But Jesus said, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. I'm going to kneel. Let's just pray together. Father in heaven, we are guilty of losing our way, and you have aptly called us sheep. We know that we wander, and Lord, for each of us, I hope we know the areas that we wander to that we shouldn't. It's always away from your presence. It's always, and we know this. God, every story points us back to you, the wisdom of being faithful to you, loving one another as Jesus did. This is what you have called us to do. It looks different, a little bit different for each of us, but we believe you are faithful and true, that you will lead us to you, back to you, away from our foolishness and our sin, to eternal life. God, may we be found faithful, is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, the one who loves us. Amen. For our closing song, please uh, turn your hymnals into hymn number 625. Higher. Thank you.
prayed two times today. Three seems like a little excessive, so I think maybe I'll sing. In Numbers chapter 6, uh, God came to Aaron and said, Aaron, these are the words I'm giving you. These are the words you shall say to bless the people. Let's bow in benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace, and give you peace, and give you peace. The Lord bless you, make his face to shine upon you. And be gracious unto you. The Lord be gracious, gracious unto you. Go in peace.